Good afternoon, everyone. I know you got to be more excited than that. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your patience as we figure out how to be live in Zoom and be in Little Rock in South Africa at the same time, but we have figured it out. Um, my name is Garbo Hearn, and I'm the director of Pyramid Art Books and Custom Framing and Hearn Fine Art, where our focus is Black culture through literature and the fine arts. Today, we are excited to bring back Reverend Griffin and Reverend Buzak to discuss their latest book, Parables, Politics, and Prophetic Faith. So we want to just thank you all for spending part of your Sunday afternoon with us, and we can get started. Reverend Griffin. Thank you, Ms. Hearn. Good afternoon. Good evening, Dr. Buzak. Uh, Dr. Buzak is live from uh, Cape Town, South Africa, where it is 10 o'clock in the evening. And uh, I'm live from Little Rock, Arkansas, where it is two plus o'clock in the afternoon. And we are glad to be here. And thank you, those of you who are live in the gallery and those of you who are joining us via Zoom for being part of this conversation. And we mean conversation about our book uh, written literally during the pandemic. During the pandemic, uh, thanks to the technology of Skype, uh, countless Skype conversations, uh, we were able to collaborate on this book uh, titled Parables, Politics and Prophetic Faith. And uh, Dr. Alan Buzak is uh, with us from South Africa, and I want to thank him for his, his genius in, in suggesting that we write this book together, and his generosity, because Al Buzak, as the world knows, is one of the leading liberation theologians in the world, in the world, and when he suggested that we collaborate on this book uh, after I realized that he was not joking. Uh, I had to contend with the fact that he is very much, when he gets serious about something, he's very much on target. He pushes himself and he pushed me and we've got this done. So let me just begin by thanking you for being present, thanking him for being present with us, and let me simply say, Dr. Buzak, how would you like to begin by expressing words of greetings from South Africa, sir? Well, thank you, uh, Judge Griffin. It is, a, it is a pleasure to be back in Little Rock, even though it is via the internet, um, and to be back at Pyramid Books. Um, Ms. Hearn, thank you so much for hosting us today. It is, um, it is always wonderful to have that connection. Judge Griffin is right, uh, except that um, the honor is uh, completely mine to have collaborated with him. We have been friends for some time now, and I have followed his work and his thinking, um, not so much as a legal scholar, uh, but I learned much about the law and the connection between the law and uh, and 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 morality and ethics and theology, but also his prophetic stance um, in just about everything that he thinks about. And so my 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 admiration for him grew into this desire uh, that we could collaborate on a book like this, and it's been. Uh, it's been a great honor and a pleasure to work with him. We decided that um, that we will that we will look at the situation in the world and at the whole desire of of ourselves to look prophetically at the situation of the world, ask serious questions uh, about our own faith and about our own stance and about our own faithfulness and about uh, the ways in which Christians ought to take uh, their stand on, on the burning issues of our day. And we decided that we should look at the 
at the scriptures and ask if we take portions of scripture and we read them as parables for their time and our time, what would that look like? And so that's how the conversation began. And so you will see that the book is divided into 12 chapters, six by myself and six by Reverend Griffin. Uh, and we, we both decided we will make our own choices um, as to what portions of scripture we will choose. Um, but of course, as he says correctly, there were hours and hours and hours of Skype conversations and emails and, and WhatsApp calls and discussions uh, as, as the book went along. We took as our paradigm, those of you who know the name of William uh, Herzog II, a New Testament scholar who was at uh, Rochester uh, Crozier Theological Seminary there, Divinity School, um, and he wrote a book about the parables of Jesus, which he called Jesus as a pedagogue of the oppressed and the parables as subversive speech. And we did not take parables of Jesus like Herzog does in his book, but we took the framework and we took his point of departure. And so from different portions of scripture, we apply that understanding. Does this sound like subversive speech? Can we, as Jesus did in his day, try as prophet called by God to, to be a subversive presence through uh, the pedagogy that those scriptures offer uh, to us in our situations today? And that's how the book came about. And those of you who have the book in your hands um, will see those, those, those scriptures, uh, passages, and will see the way we have, uh, we have decided to approach that. Um, we thought, first of all, that we would simply write um, as simply as possible, as directly in terms of a conversation in the book with our reader, not try to write an an academic piece, although there is very serious research behind every chapter. Um, and we thought we should keep the footnotes to a minimum, uh, because sometimes footnotes hinder the, the conversation the authors want to have with their reading audience. Um, but in the end, we decided it may be better to put some footnotes in so that those of you who are curious and you want to dig a little bit deeper, can have some idea as to which direction you want to go um, in that and read and read some more. But basically, the book that is in your hand is a is a is a collaborative effort, not just in terms of our understanding of the urgency of our global situation and the urgency of the church and of the prophetic voice of the church to be heard in the situations, but is genuinely an effort born out of love for, for scripture, out of love for our people, um, out of love for the world that God has created and the world that God has in mind, and out of love for one another. Um, and, and I think if you read that book carefully, all of this uh, will readily come to the fore. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful pleasure and it's a great honor to be sharing this moment with Judge Griffin and with you all. Thank you. We wrote each six chapters. And as Dr. Busak mentioned, we each chose the chapters we we're going to write, the scriptures we we're going to write for, we're write uh, about. Uh, Dr. Busak Dr. wrote the first two, and then uh, a third, uh, I wrote the second two, and then a third, they were each alternated, uh, one after the other. Uh, but we were blessed by the people who served us with foreword and uh, a preface. Uh, none other than our dear friend, Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, wrote uh, a, a powerful foreword. And after reading the foreword, uh, I almost wanted Dr. Right to have a chapter, 
because it was just that profound. Uh, if you have the book in your hand and you read that forward, you need to understand that Dr. Wright wrote that forward with one hand because he's he's had a stroke for the past five years and he uh, wrote with one hand uh, and did all that. As he has said, he said, the devil affected the left side of my body, but the Lord kept my mind, kept me my right mind. <laughs> and he has shared no pain in writing uh, an interesting foreword for us. And we were blessed also by the assistance of Reverend Dr. Teresa Smallwood, who is a liberation theologian, an ethics, ethical theologian at United Lutheran uh, Seminary in Pennsylvania, who uh, also helped us. With that kind of backing, we felt like we could uh, offer this work to the world. Let me just simply say, Dr. Buzak, and this would be a conversation between us and you. Let me simply say to those of you who are in the gallery, as well as those of you who are viewing this online, you are part of history because you are the first audience who will have a conversation with the two of us since this book came out on 1 October. And I want to give, I want to acknowledge with thanks uh, the uh, our publisher at Good Faith Media uh, for uh, for uh, accepting our manuscript. Uh, Dr. Buzak and I were surprised. We submitted the manuscript literally on the 31st of January of this year. Uh, inside a week, Good Faith Media's editor had gotten back to us and said, "We want to publish it." Now, if you write books. You're familiar with getting rejections. If you write for publication, uh, you have to live with rejection. Uh, I am familiar with getting rejection slips inside a week. I never got an acceptance message inside a week, and so this was this was literally uh, like a message from above. This was a a, a, a blessing on the book. From that, we did the usual things authors do, editing manuscripts, editing, 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 editing. If you write, you write. And then as somebody told me, the best writing is good rewriting. So uh, we did a lot of rewriting, but we had blessings with that. Let me, before I go any further, let me acknowledge the presence of my wife and my son and my daughter in love who are also in this uh, in this space. Uh, and I want to thank them for their support. Uh, Dr. Buzak's wife and my wife had to deal with us with the time differences and the early mornings and late nights and all that kind of business. But uh, thank you for the, for the blessing of that. Let's get to the work. Why this book? Dr. Buzak, why did you think we needed to write this book? Well, uh, I think if 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 people read uh, Doctor Wright's and um, Doctor Smallwood's uh, forward and 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 preface, they will get an understanding uh, why it was necessary to read this book. And if they read the introduction, you will see that the title of the introduction is a quote from. Uh, Chairman Mao Zedong from uh, China uh, in the in, in the 1960s at the height of the so-called Cultural Revolution, when there was great chaos uh, in China, and and Mao made a very interesting observation. He he said there is great or utter chaos under the heavens, and then he stopped. And then he added, so he says the chances or the opportunities are excellent. Now, uh, there are people who say that Mao meant that while there is great chaos, it's the best opportunities for him to push through his particular ideological ideas and his kind of, of, of thinking onto the people of China. But 
there is another way of thinking about that. And that is that if there is chaos that is so deep and so undeniable that it can no longer be ignored or sidestepped or talked down or whatever uh, by, by anybody, when the people realize this is it, we are at the edge of a great catastrophe, um, or we have catastrophes behind us that have been pushing us to an even greater catastrophe. Then when they come to that realization, it is actually at that moment that the greatest possibility of hopeful action for people come into view. Because then people realize this is now the time for us to take action. We have to take our agency into our own hands. If we don't take hold of our history, we will never be able to shape our destiny and we will never be able to participate in the shaping of our history or in the reshaping of our history or in saving our situation and all our country. Um, in, in, in the Christian language, we call that a kairos moment. Um, a moment in which God confronts us with a particular situation in history. And so a Kairos moment is a moment of clarity. It is a moment maybe of shock, of knowing where we have brought ourselves, knowing how far we have drifted from God's purposes for us and for God's world, knowing that this is a moment that God says, this is a moment of conversion, and it is a moment of commitment. Um, and you have to take that moment because Kairos moments uh, are not moments that hang around. You, if, if you realize that this is the moment, you have to step in and ask God for the grace and the mercy and the strength to do what is necessary. Um, and, and But it's also a moment of grace because if God had not stepped in, opened our eyes, reminded us of our own calling as prophetic voices to speak uh, what God's truth is to the world in general. Um, then we would have they would have been drowned in that moment and it would have been gone. So that Kairos moment is a moment that we realize that we find ourselves in. And if anybody who looks at world politics today, it doesn't matter where you look, across the world, um, I am of the opinion and that is the conclusion we both came to, that, that, that certainly in our lifetime, there has never been such a crisis, a crisis in leadership, a crisis in political understanding, a crisis of insight, a crisis of wisdom. I mean, I have seen in my lifetime a lot of things, but the low level of political stupidity, pure political stupidity, not knowing where to go, which which direction to go. Uh, I mean, it's it's the crisis of leadership, all of that, and of vision, all of that is so apparent today. And on, on top of that, we have war upon war upon war. And when we started this book, the, the, the war in Ukraine has just started between NATO and Russia. Um, and so uh, we, 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 we knew about the Palestinian situation, of course, because our involvement uh, to uh, with and our commitment to the cause of the Palestinian struggle uh, has been clear for some time now. We did not know that we would be with Palestine where we are today. Yeah. And yet almost everything we wrote about Palestine in that in that book is applicable today. Um, and so it is it is it is actually quite it's actually quite scary if, 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 if you see what, what you wrote a year ago is actually happening on the world stage now. Uh, but it is also an, a, a confirmation of how God opens God's word for understanding to those who have ears to listen, whose hearts are open and whose mind are captured by the mind of Christ, as the Apostle Paul writes. And so it's, for us, that that is what has driven us um, uh, into, into, into writing this book. And so 
we we are hoping that those who read this book chapter by chapter um from the very beginning to the end will come and see oh uh, this is uh, not just the so-called wisdom of two persons who believe in the power of Jesus Christ uh, to open your eyes and to see what is happening in the world but who uh, people who are inviting all of us to ask the question like what that we ask in the epilogue. So what is it that we have to do right now at this particular time? One thing that we tried to do was to be honest with ourselves about the issues of our time. For instance, as Dr. Buzak mentioned, when we began writing this book, the war in Ukraine, NATO and Ukraine uh, uh, and Russia, uh, was just beginning, but we're also beginning to come the, the pandemic. Yeah. And we were dealing with the issues of rising fascism in this country. People weren't calling it fascism. They were calling it something else, calling it religious nationalism. But we were seeing the rise in authoritarianism. We're seeing basically people treating government as if it was a private perk. War was being treated basically as a for-profit for enterprise. We began writing this book as the United States was literally about to end a 20-year war in Afghanistan. Now, I don't know about very many of the readers, but in my lifetime, I'm 71 years old. I cannot recall a period of time when this nation has been at war for so long and so few people have paid attention to it the longer the war got. And as it was in Afghanistan, it appears to be now working with the war NATO and Ukraine. And if I may say so, Dr. Buzak, it would appear to be the same script as being returned in Palestine. Yes. The longer, I mean, people don't realize that we had been mindful about the issue in Palestine for decades. The two of us have been. Palestine is now on the front page and we were writing about this, thinking about this, talking about this, and trying to reason with each other about this. However, uh, people were not paying attention. But another thing happened. In 2020, there was this one, th th there was this terrible thing called George Floyd. Yeah. Breonna Taylor. Ahmaud Arbery, the United States. And so part of my forceful factors in writing the book were driven by what was going on on the racial justice front. And so the first two chapters I contributed dealt with the uncomfortable subject of reparations. Now, let's just be clear. Uh, I haven't heard very many sermons on reparations. And not very many book studies on reparations. And not many Sunday school lessons about reparations. But the issue of reparatory justice is not a sideline issue in scripture. It runs away all the way. The theme runs through scripture again and again. And so we, we talked about that. Dr. Buzak also dealt with the issue of some of the violence in the in, in our scripture and how uh in particular i love the chapters you wrote about the bramble dr buzak i hope you'll talk about a little bit uh how uh in scripture we see how oftentimes those that are least competent are chosen to hold the most power. Yeah. yeah. 
And Dr. Buzak, that actually is me tossing a ball to you because most people may not have had a chance to look at our text and without giving a spoiler away, would you uh, would you whet their appetite about that wonderful uh, chapter you wrote on the bramble? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, thank you. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, before I get to the bramble, is one of the things that 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 I've always been uh, captured with and fascinated with is the stunning similarities of the history of our people here in South Africa and our people in in the United States uh, of America. Um, the way uh, we were. Uh, kidnapped and stolen and transported and enslaved and, and so forth and so forth and apartheid in South Africa and Jim Crow and the whole enslavement history and the role of uh, of scripture and the church and, and how black people took their agency and their own understanding of what God is saying in the Bible and the biblical stories and of course the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, to form a theology that overturned the dominant narrative and returned to to what Jesus was trying to tell us that all of that fascinated me and 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 if you take our our look from the US and from South Africa in this book um, you will be struck by by that one but that one fact um, how these histories are intermeshed um, and how there are these these wonderful interconnections, which also means that there is a that there is an unbreakable bond, and there is an unbreakable prophetic witness from this side of the ocean to that other side of the ocean, um, and that keeps a conversation going. That I can say in my what more than fifty years of being involved in liberation theology and thinking and writing, that is quite unique um, uh, in 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 the world. Uh, so so so, I hope that you will see that emerging in in that book. But to come back to the bramble, I I I have been fascinated by the book of Judges for a very long time, and I remember thinking about writing the book of Judges Wendell way back in the 1990s. But somehow, I mean, you you you, you don't get to it. Uh, you haven't read enough. You don't understand enough. Um, and, and so you hold back, you hold back. But, but now, what is it, 30 years later, uh, rereading the book of Judges, I thought, yeah, this is the time. Because most people, if you read all the commentaries about justice, most commentaries talk about Judges um, as a book of incredible, inexplicable, indescribable violence. Yeah. And, 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 and there's debates uh, amongst the scholars as what to do with this violence in this book. Uh, I read the violence of Judges not as an invitation to violence or a justification of violence or to say this is what God wants because you see that in patches of, of judges. I mean there's a there, there's a there's a there's a there's a chapter in which the writer of that I think it's chapter 18, 19, 20, when 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 you that that part of judges written by those people who wrote that part, because it's written by different people, you can see that, from a different tradition and different thinking. But they say it is not good that the Israelites are living amongst these Canaanites, let's say these Palestinians, um, yeah. without, without fighting, because that was not the idea that Joshua had in mind. Um, and so the difference in character of the book of Judges and the book of Joshua strikes one. Um, and in those chapters, it says, but God now needs to teach Israel how to fight because they'd forgotten how to make war. So nothing about this God who wants to take the swords and turn them into pruning hooks and all of that nonsense. They want a God that fights and that is a, a warrior. Um and 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 so it, it it really does look uh, 
And that horrific, horrific, horrific chapter, of course, in chapter 19, about the concubine of the Levite. Um, so, yeah. but I read, I read Judges as an absolute devastating commentary, critical commentary on violence. From chapter one to the last chapter, it says, see, this is what happens if you allow yourself to be lured into this temptation called violence, that you think you can control it, that you think you can justify it, that you can even think it comes from God. Anyway, so, yeah. so that is what I find fascinating in the book of Judges. But now right in the middle of the book of Judges in chapter nine, there we find the first parable in the whole Bible. Uh, and it's a parable that is told by a guy called Jotham, the son of the famous Gideon, uh, who died, and and then he had brothers and so forth, and and the one brother uh, kills all of his other brothers because he wants to claim the kingship for himself, which his father, Gideon, when they offered it to him, declined by the way, which all which sets the tone for understanding politics, and so so Joseph tells this parable of the trees that you will find in chapter nine, where all the trees decide, we've got, to, we've got to have a king, we've got to have a king, we've got to have a king. We can't, it's like it's like Samuel, uh, second Samuel chapter eight. We've got to, or first Samuel, we've got to have a king to be like the other nations. And so they've got to have a king. And so they go around in this parable, the trees from one tree to the other, to the olive tree, to the, to the vine, um, and so forth. And they ask, will you please be king over us? And one after the other, these noble trees say no. And then finally, they go to the bramble. Now, the bramble is the least noble of all the trees. The, the bramble is a bush. The bramble is a thing with thorns. It's that, a thistle. Yeah, it's a thistle, yeah. It blooms, it blooms once in the season, but uh, the thorns get in the way, so you can't get to the flower. So that, to me is the bramble is, is, is the worst representation of politics. And yet the trees go to the bramble. That's democracy. We choose to be ruled by the bramble. We go and we bow down before the bramble. We say to the bramble, rule over us. So by the time we discover that the bramble does not intend to keep any of his promises that the bramble is a violent thing because the bramble says, now, if you, if you want me as your king, I will be your king and I will offer you shade. Come and sit under my shade. And he knows he's lying because he doesn't have any leaves. He doesn't have any shade. And the shade- Thistles have no shade. About, that's right. So the shade they're talking about is what is what is what good politics should offer. In other words, justice and peace and security and protection and compassion and a living humane community. Uh, uh, he promises all of that which he doesn't have. And the people know, the other trees know that he's lying. And yet they go and they choose him. I see that as a parable of ourselves. That's what we do with democracy. That is why the title of that book is Democracy That Leads to Disasters. Um, and, and, and so we choose the leaders with no vision, with no integrity, with no virtue, with no decency, with no honesty. And yet, uh, when we then get into trouble, we want to run to God and say, please, please, please help us. No, you can't do that because that's the choices that you make. So what do we do when we are in the situation where we have chosen the bramble to rule over us? Um, how do we get from under the bramble? How do we, how do we reshape politics to be the politics uh, of what W.E.D. B. Du Bois calls the politics of honesty and decency and integrity and virtue and courage. And so, so, so I, I just thought that that is such a, a powerful, powerful analogy for where we are in the world today, because look at the world leaders. I don't care where you look. Look at the world leaders today. I have been thinking, I found maybe one person, she happens to be a woman, that I think is not a bramble. But, you know, 
other people may find something else. But so, so, so that's the kind of thing we discover in reading the scriptures together, in looking at our world situation together and trying to make those connections. Can you see how we sort of look at scriptures as parables? If you're looking at judges as Dr. Buzak did, uh, and you are living in a place that had been led for the last several years by a fellow who was a serial liar, a corporate cheat, and, and a commercial incompetent, and then all of the politicians choose this person, even on my side of the Atlantic, and on Dr. Buzak's side of the Atlantic, you've got somebody who is, uh, well, let's just say, you say it, Dr. Buzak. Well, let's call it, let's call it what it is. I mean, Cyril Ramaphosa is probably the most corrupt, most incompetent, most spineless leader that a country can wish upon itself. But we chose him. We went to that bramble. Um, so for us in South Africa, the question is, how do we get away from the bramble? Now, the story of the bramble is a story that says politics as it is, it, it can't be different. It is, it is always corrupt. It is always mendacious. It is always not right. It is always, so, so is it possible? So we have to jump from judges to the Psalms, but what does the Psalm 82 say? Is there not a possibility of a king who really protects the weak and the poor and the widow and the defenseless? Is it not possible to have the politics of Romans 13 verse four, that a government is only a force from God or a authority from God if it is ruling for the good of the people. Um, is that not a possibility? So the, the parable that we are wrestling with is the political reality. Is it possible for South Africa, from my point of view, or from Judge Randall Griffin's point of view, for the United States to get away from the brambles under which we, we suffer today, before which we bow today, and to find a cedar of Lebanon? A, a, a paragon of uprightness is politics salvageable is politics in general redeemable is the question and and what 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 is what is the contribution that pers people of faith can make to redeem politics and make politics a force for good um for the sake of the people that god has created to live a different life abundant life right and remember, the subtitle of our book is Hope and Perseverance in Times of Peril. It's not just that we live in times of peril. We've got to take an honest look at the fact that we do live in perilous times. And the reason we wrote the book is to, is to say, listen, let's not be Pollyannish. We're in a mess. Yeah. Okay? Let's not be Pollyannish. At the same time, let's not be chicken little. Let's not walk around saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. There's no hope. In scripture, there are alternatives. There is a holy alternative, a hopeful alternative. But you've got to be able, before you say, hey, you see the hope, you've got to be honest about the mess. Yeah. Yeah. And part of what we do in this book and time after time is we take we begin by saying let's look at the mess and why we are in this mess now we're preachers okay you expect us to talk about the mess but we also have a responsibility to be healers and we have to offer a message of hope and that's why the subtitle of the book is hope and perseverance yes our politics, our politics seems to major in picking brambles. However, 
that is not the only way. Or as Paul put it, there is a more excellent way. That's right. The bramble is not the only vegetation in scripture. There are also cedars. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There are also cedars. And, and as Dr. Guzak mentioned. Like Dr. Mendel yeah. uh, uh, takes us to the story of Zacchaeus uh, and to the story of Micaiah uh, to let us see that 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 the opposite of what the bramble represents is also possible. And if we follow the example that Zacchaeus sets us, and if we recall uh, and bring Micaiah back into the conversation, uh, with his honesty and his understanding and his obedience to God, even when he ends up being thrown in prison, uh, always keeping in mind that 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 word that 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 my friend Wendell keeps on saying to me when I run out of faith and I run I run out of uh, out of courage. He says to me, "Remember that word that God said." to Ezekiel chapter two, I think it is, right, Wendell? Where Ezekiel, yeah. where God says to Ezekiel, and they shall know that there was a prophet of God among them. And so it's it's that it's that kind of rootedness in our attempt to be faithful that you must see as the driving force behind this book. Now, we can talk to you about the book as writers. Let me just say this, and then I'll open the floor for questions. You're probably wondering, well, why should we read this book? You told us why you wrote it. Uh, why should we read this book? Uh, we're not theologians. We didn't spend time on Skype and all the kind of business. And uh, so why should we read this book? Well, from my point, if you're concerned about justice, if you're concerned about excellence in public policy, if you're concerned about whether there is a hopeful way to get out of the mess we're in, you should read this book because quite frankly, if you are in a mess, you want to figure out how to get out of it. And the one way to get out of it is to ask people who've taken a hard look at the mess and are pointing directions. Part of what I think Dr. Guzek and I, I try to do in this book is say to people of faith, listen, don't lose heart. We're not the first people in creation or in human history to have to deal with bramble kind of leadership. We're not the first people in creation. We're not the first generation in creation to deal with the mess that we see. So let us offer some suggestions. I like to suggest that whether you're talking about the issue of reparations, we're not the first people in the history of Black folks to ask the hard question, what in the world can be done about a society that will actually steal the lives, the labor, and the excellence of people for generations and want you to just forget about it? Is there another alternative? Or what can be done about a nation calling itself the richest nation in the world and in the same time zone, you've got one of the poorest nations in the world? We are one of the richest nations in the world, and in our same in our same hemisphere, there's Haiti. And we like to forget that Haiti was the first independent revolutionary government after the US Revolution that defeated a European empire. and the United States refused to recognize it, but sided with the European French to put Haiti in debt for becoming independent. 
So the reason Haiti is so poor is not because Haitians are, are not wealthy people, or not because Haitians are lazy people. They, their wealth has been stolen. How do we think about that? How do we prophetically look at that issue? Uh, and so these are the, that's, we want you to think about these things because Haiti is real. Reparations is real. And we do have passages in our Bible that can offer us insight on things like that, whether it's violence, whether it's political incompetence, whether it's reparations, whether it's hateful faith. Hello? I mean, we don't have a lack of faith. We have a prevalence of hateful faith. And so how do we deal with these issues? So that's why we think this book is worth reading. We wrote it because we had to. You know, the spirit of the Lord was on us and we had to, came, could, can't help us. But we believe you should read it and people should think about it because quite frankly, we believe that what we had to write people can be helped by. You can tell us whether we're wrong, but you can't do it without reading. That's a shameless plug. <laughs> now, uh, is it fair to ask you if you want to ask any questions? And if you don't ask questions, uh, we'll keep talking, And but you, you can ask questions. Dr. Buzak, do you have anything else you want to share? No, no, no. I'm waiting for the questions. Thank you. All right. Now, you have Alan Buzak who is awake now at 11 o'clock in, in South Africa. You can say, I kept Alan Buzak awake in the middle of the night. <laughs> uh, what are your questions? And, uh, and I, I want to give the opportunity for those in the chat, as well as those who are in, uh, in person that pose questions to us. Some so. Yes, sir. Okay. Jason Smith. Good to see. You. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Jason Smith, back to Peace Fellowship. Um, and you know, the, the idea of the Granville leadership um, reminds me too of just a lot of what I hear from a lot of peacemakers and folks, especially from my generation and younger, is just the despondence. The just, I mean, what's the point? It's, it's, it's where the hopelessness almost seems to be too large and looms just over everything. Yeah. And it's almost hard to find even to get a handle on something. And so were there places where that you gravitated toward, I, I imagine, that really gave you know some kind of hope for folks um, you know, who, who are really starting this work and engaging this work and, and trying to be peacemakers in this world? And so let me repeat your question for the benefit of those who may be outside of the actual presence and may not have heard it. Uh, the question is, uh, what can be done to offer hope for people who are looking at the at the low level, the low competence, the low quality of our leadership to give us a word of hope? And particularly, Dr. Buzak, uh, as you dealt so eloquently uh, and so straightforwardly on this issue of the Bramble. Since we have chosen these Campbell Bramble leaders and Bramble policies, let's just say, it's not just bramble leaders. We got sticky you know, policies that are cutting us and sticking us. Uh, is there what's what's the hopeful way out, Dr. Buzak? Well, uh, it seems to me that there is both a short-term situation and a long-term situation to deal with. Um, the honest truth is that we have. Over the look, look at both the United States and South Africa. We have set the bar for political leadership and perhaps also ecclesiastical leadership so low um, that we have ended up with a political elite that is entirely not capable of understanding or giving leadership uh, at all in the situation in which we are. 
we have created a political system that has that has the name of a democracy, but in fact is not. The United States is not a democracy. The United States is uh, is an autocracy. It's a it's a plutocracy. I mean, that study by scholars at Northwestern University and Princeton University of a few years ago that came to the conclusion that at best, the United States is an incidental democracy because it is in fact ruled by the elite and wealthy classes. And all our politicians are beholden to the people with the money. Uh, and so democracy only happens when the interest of the people happen to coincide with the interest of the moneyed classes who really rule our countries. Now that's the same here. Um, we, 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 I mean, why does Biden not listen to the hundreds of thousands of people uh, on the street on the question of Palestine and Israel? Why does Biden not listen to what is it now almost 80% of people in the Democratic Party who wants the war to end? And almost 60% even in the Republican Party who wants the war to end, if my figures are correct, that I heard last. But overwhelmingly, the people who voted him into power want him to stop the war. But he keeps on, he, he, he blocked for the third time, he blocked a, 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 a Security Council resolution uh, just the other day because he doesn't want the war to stop. So he is totally in favor of genocide, which is happening today. He's a murderer of children while his people tell him, don't be that. We do not want you to do that in our name. But who does he listen to? So, so, so we don't have a democracy here. We have the same thing. We had two hundred thousand people uh, in a march in Cape Town only, alone in Cape Town. That's a huge thing. And we said to the South African government, cut ties with the Israeli government chase the ambassador away, no diplomatic ties, uh, give your full backing to uh, the, the program of boycotts and divestment and sanctions, like we asked the world to do with apartheid South Africa, we must do to apartheid Israel. He doesn't want to, why? Because of his, of his subservience to the Zionists in this country and in Israel and elsewhere and in the United States who want South Africa to be on Israel's side. And so he ignores the opinion and the demands of the vast majority of these people. And so we, we don't have a democracy. So we have a long-term thing to fix. How do we change our system? And it seems to me that our political system, both here and there, seems to attract the kind of people who have no principles, uh, who have no rootedness in honesty or integrity, who can be bought um, for ridiculously low sums of money, um, as, long as, they, as long as they can line their pockets. That's, that's what we've got. And so how do we fix a political system that seems to attract the brambles only. Uh, because South Africa is chock-a-block full of very talented, very honest people with lots of integrity, with lots of leadership qualities who can lead this country. But why are they not attracted to politics? So we have to fix that. So the second question we have to say, how do we raise a new generation of people who know that their political responsibility is also a not just a civic responsibility, it is a faith responsibility. Because politics should be there to serve justice and to be compassionate 
um, and to defend the defenses. And so everything that the Bible tells us about politics should be realized. I have found that the politics of Jesus is not only the politics of the common good, it's also the politics of common sense. It is the best way to make the world work. So how do we raise a new generation of young people whose role models for the last 30 years have only been greedy people without principles who claim to be politicians and who claim to be representatives only as long as the campaign lasts. Then they no longer are representatives, they represent only those who have bought them. So, so that's, that's what we need to fix. And then in the yes. meantime, as in right now, we got to find an answer as to what do we do when the next election comes around. Th th those are the practical issues that we have to wrestle with. And what does it mean to create hope in a situation like this, in a practical way and in a long-term way, so that even when I leave this earth, I will have left something behind for my children to follow because the process has to be developed into its full bloom. Thank you, Jason. Another question. I uh, I see a question from Asen Wright Riggins on uh, on uh, on the Zoom on the chat. Yes, and would Aidson, you like me to read that? Yes, would you please read that, uh, Sister Anna Hearn? Thank you so much. Sure. So uh, they had to step away because they were at a dinner party. Uh, but they their comment was as I read the book. I grew increasingly more amazed and prayerful by your courage. Daring to speak subversive speech in this day and age where prophets are cruelly persecuted and ostracized. In the words of Dr. Jeremiah Wright, what makes you so strong? Do you write and speak in fear? And if so, how do you deal with that fear? Ah, uh, thank you, Aitzen. Right, Riggins. Aitzen Wright Riggins is formerly the uh, director of uh, the American Baptist Home Mission Society, Mission Society, and uh, is uh, is uh, a, a theologian in his own right. He's also a mayor now. Uh, so the issue of public policy and justice are real. He's a mayor in Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, he he knows about the issues of policy and dealing with brambles. Uh, Dr. Buzak, you want to deal with well, the issue of fear? I mean, you first, have I dealt with I'll, I'll follow up, please, Judge Randall. Uh, I do not, I, I do not forget the most frequently seen or uh, uh, found injunction in the Bible. The most frequent injunction in the Bible, two words, fear not. Yeah. That's not a suggestion. That is not a suggestion. It is an imperative. It is an it is an order. Um, have no fear. Uh, to be prophetic means that you must not allow your life to be driven by fears. And Jesus said it very well. Uh, what can they do to you except kill you? And you can't die but once. However, if you live in a life that is unprincipled, then you lose something even worse, your soul. And Jesus asked the question, what does it profit a person? If you gain the whole world, if you gain power and prestige and celebrity, and you lose your soul, you lose your core. And so I am not afraid of killers of my body or of my wealth. Uh, wealth comes and goes. And health comes and goes. However, uh, character and courage are defining marks of prophetic lives. And that passage that Dr. Buzak referred to, which is my favorite passage in all of Ezekiel, from the second chapter of Ezekiel, the first seven verses, uh, where the word is, look, I'm sending you into this kind of world. 
I'm sending you into a world where people are not going to do right. I am not sending you into a world where folks want to do right. I'm sending you into a world where folks have not wanted to do right for a long time. And your job is to be a prophet, whether they like it or not. And they're going to be mean to you. And I wrote about this in one of the chapters. You live among briars and scorpions. Yeah. Briars and scorpions are not nice playmates. But the word is, remember you're called to be a prophet. Now that's the, that's my take on it, Doc. You, what's your take? Well, you're right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've i just been thinking. Um. I don't want to talk too much about myself, but I've been in this struggle now for for most of my life. Um, and in the crosshairs of very violent, very desperate uh, people uh, without any conscience whatsoever. Uh, it is an extraordinarily painful thing that even now, after our so-called liberation, I have to live with the same kind of reality that I lived with before 1994. So you are still in the crosshairs of people who are capable of anything. Um, and so, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that because of that, I've gotten used to it. I don't. I, uh, I still, I still get up uh, every day, or <clears throat> after a moment that I know that I've been called to speak God's truth, I cannot help but wonder what are they planning now. So, judgmental Griffin is right. That's why. We have been called, I am sending you. And that's the only thing that makes sense. I also remind myself that Jesus um, did warn us. Jesus said, I'm sending you into this world as a sheep amongst the wolves. I, and this is what they will do to you. And Jesus spends almost 40 verses of chapter 10 of the Gospel of Matthew warning us and warning us and telling us just like it's going to be without sugarcoating anything. This is what's going to happen if you try to be my follower. Um, but I must say, with all of that, um, and I'm not an exceptionally brave person, um, I'm afraid of what might happen to me. I worry about my family. Um, but 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 I worry more about about my about my standing before God. Uh, it's like that story I I keep on telling, which I first told at the Proctor Conference, which was now what the same year that we met, uh, Judge Griffin. The story about that school principal um, in Soweto, uh, when the kids were doing their revolution here in 1976, and everything was burning up. And this was a, a principal who was a very cautious, patient kind of black man, didn't want to offend white people, didn't want to offend the government, always warning the children, don't be so impatient. And then finally, he found himself caught up in the revolution. And his white friends loved him. Uh, for for being the calming influence in that uh, in, in 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 the black situation, and when he finally got himself leading a march and speaking on behalf of the children and and joining the revolution, his white friends asked him, "Why are you doing that?" And he said, "You know, I've been thinking. Um, one day I will die, and then I will have to stand." before the great judge in heaven. And the judge will ask me, where are your wounds? And if I say I have no wounds, the judge will ask me, was there then nothing to fight for? And so that's what I think about. 
And it's a very real story. It's a very real situation. Um, and if you look around and you see how much there is to fight for, how can you then be afraid of, of being wounded if others are not only wounded, like in Palestine, but 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 cold-bloodedly murdered, genocided before your very eyes. That, to me, the blood of children takes away every argument, every argument. So I just keep quiet and I try to do what I think God wants me to do at, at this point. I don't know whether the answer is the question, but it's the only way I can, Judge Griffin. Yeah, yeah. Sister Anna, you have uh, other other questions in the in the live audience or in the chat. There are no um, other typed comments, but everyone is welcome. If you are on the Zoom call, you are able to unmute and ask your question if you would like. Any Doctor Doctor Sherman James is here, and he has a question. Okay, in the, uh, in the live area. Dr. James? I took the last, I took the first on the last one, Dr. Buzak, Dr. Sherman James asked, where do we get hope uh, to deal with the issues of the human, the human flaws that are so recurrent in scripture and obvious before us? Well, uh, fair summary? well uh, I mean, uh, I always fall back onto a thing I discovered uh, some time ago. Um, father Augustine, the church father uh, from Africa uh, in the fifth uh, century, 
said that hope is a mother with two beautiful daughters. The one is called anger and the other one is called courage. The anger to be outraged at the wrongs around us and the injustices that we see, especially those being done to others more vulnerable than ourselves. And the courage to rise up and do something about it, that's hope. So if you don't have that kind of hope, we should not talk about hope. Otherwise, it's just sentimentalism. Um, uh, and, 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 and so for me, doing what I can right now is so hope must be embodied in the things that we believe that are possible for I for, for, wait, for, for wait. the politicians and let me just say that the, for the politicians politics is the art of the possible but somebody oh maybe some 60 years ago said to me that politics for the christian is the art of expecting the lord it's yeah. it's it's an eschatology so you do your politics as if jesus is coming back tomorrow to check up on you that's 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 that, that's how politics should be for those of us anchored in faith then all of the other things don't matter if you it's not it's not the kind of cheap easy evangelicalist question of what would jesus do no 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 is what would jesus if jesus came back tomorrow what would jesus see you do in mm. this world to change whatever needs to be changed or to bring the realities of the kingdom of god closer uh, to to the aspirations of God's children. Dr. James, I'll, ask, I'll answer your question in two ways. First of all, using the reparations example, uh, I, I, I looked at the example of Zacchaeus in Luke's gospel. You recall Zacchaeus, the rich, uh, wealthy, chief tax collector in Jericho, uh, who Jesus on his way back to Jerusalem for his last time, intentionally stopped by. He could have bypassed Jericho, but he stopped by intentionally and made a house call. Well, actually he had a bottom of the tree call uh, on Zacchaeus and then invited himself to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. Uh, that was not a political move, nor was it a social move. Jesus was not trying to get featured in the society section of the Jericho News. Uh, and from what we read in the text, it does not appear that Jesus and Zacchaeus spent their time talking about how the Zerico soccer team was going to be faring in the upcoming matches. That's the kind of stuff we usually do. We faithful folks usually do. We meet with politicians. We usually talk about stuff that doesn't matter. The example I get from Hope is the example of Jesus who however long it took, stayed at Zacchaeus' house and long enough for Zacchaeus to come to himself and say, wait a minute, I am wealthy as a result of dishonest means. And without giving it away, well, you know the end of the story. Zacchaeus made a pledge. Half of what I have, I'm going to give to the poor. And if I have taken anything by fraud, dishonestly, I'm going to repay it four times. Now that means Jesus talked with Zacchaeus long enough and dealt with him straightforward enough until Zacchaeus felt a moral imperative to downsize. Sister Zacchaeus had to change how much room was in the house or she was not going to live in the same kind of house. That is not a political move. That is a prophetic move. And our hope, as I see it, does not lie in politics as usual. It lies in citizens who are prophetic. Do we have a notion of our faith and our citizenship that causes us to expect more than just a political compromise. Because if that's what you do, 
which use the brambles. You know, the lowest common denominator is a bramble. But you don't get justice from brambles. You get more of the same. And so that's how I see the whole. Uh, and I see that example again and again in scripture. Jesus, as Paul does, has shows us a more excellent way. Again and again in scripture, we have examples of Jesus showing us not only an example of more excellent way, but also the second thing I want to say is the danger of not choosing more excellent way. We look at the realities of our time and we ask ourselves, do we have do we have just religion or do we have rich young ruler religion? You recall Jesus had another situation where he was a fellow came to him and asked him, Hey, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Do this, you know, love God, love your neighbor. He said, Oh, I've done all of my life. This is a child. He says, Yeah, I love you. Now you get you. Go and divest. And in Mark's gospel, the answer was the guy left Jesus sadly because he was very wealthy. I see a hopeful call that we can begin to talk about the justice of divestment as opposed to the justice the, the, and, the, and talk about the injustice of greed. Most of us don't want to admit it, but Martin Luther King Jr. was by our current standards a failure as a preacher. He did not have a mega church. He did not have a mega pulpit. He died a poor man. And he died dishonorable. He died murdered. Working for the least of these. Crucified. <laughs> Crucified. Jesus would have flunked. By our current standards, Jesus could not get invited to preach at most of our churches. However, the politics of Jesus are our hope. And I see that. That's the reason why I'm a preacher. And that's the reason why I think Dr. Guzek and I are are. are serious about what we're talking about. We see hope in the example of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and the call for Jesus. Jesus says, not just watch me, Jesus says, follow me. And Jesus is crazy enough to say, follow me, because Jesus believes we can. And that in following Jesus, it makes a difference in the world. It makes the kind of holy difference and the fair difference that we're talking about here. But that's a that's a that's a decisive choice. Am I answer your question? I, I saw a message from Sister Anna Heron said wrapping up. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I one of those one of those things where you don't want to have the audience leave you. <laughs> I should thank you, Dr. Buzak, for staying with us, and thank you for being with us this evening, this afternoon. You've shared your time. I want to make sure I sign books, and I'll be here as long as you want me to sign books and talk. Thank you. Again, I want to thank my wife and my sons. Dr. Buzak, you want to have full closing words? No, no, no. Just to say thank you very much. It was a very good conversation. And I, I, I do hope that people will go get that book. Uh, let Judge Griffin sign it. Uh, God willing, when we get to the United States, hopefully uh, in the early part of next year, uh, I'll come by Little Rock, you bring the book, and I'll sign my name under his name, uh, just to make sure that you got us both. Do not leave, Sister Triopia. Irene Robinson Bryant has closing words. The Zoom audience, please stay by. You don't want to miss this. May I use your mic? You certainly may. Dr. Buzak, the Reverend Griffin, we at Hearn Fine Art 
would like to thank you. Pyramid Art Books Custom Framing here in Fine Art would like to thank you for coming and introducing this book that is one of the ingredients that we should definitely add to our lives and to our time. So thank you for coming. We'd like to thank also the audience that's on Zoom and those of you who are here. We have a full house here at Hearn Fine Art. And uh, let me read, if you would, the last paragraph of the foreword by Dr. Jeremiah Wright, Jr. It's very, very telling. Bozak and Griffin have laid out the ingredients for a new cake, this time with the sugar included as one of the constituting elements. The new meal has been prepared. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trust in God. And then he says, enjoy the meal, the table is set. And with that, the table is set in our gallery for the signing of this new meal book, Parables, Politics, and Prophetic Faith by none other than the Dr. Alan Busak and the Reverend Wendell L. Griffin. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Buzak. You can go to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone who right. joined us on the Zoom. We have stopped the live stream.